Hello everyone, here are the three giving options for the First Baptist Church of Hesperia. You can go to our website at fbch.org and choose Give at the right side of the menu. On the Give page, enter the amount you wish to give and choose if it is a one-time or a recurring give and press Next. You will then be asked to enter and confirm a phone number to continue to the payment page. Another option is by cash or check. Please mail checks to 9280 Maple Avenue, Hesperia, California, 92345. Thank you for your giving faithfulness. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to call the church. Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church of Hesperia. My name is Jeannie Greenman and I work with the Skate Riot Ministry and host the 1015 service online. These are your announcements for Sunday, March 19th, 2023. This morning we're holding a ministry fair out in the church foyer. Check out our ministries by visiting their booths after all service times today. As believers and followers of Jesus, we were given spiritual gifts. If this is new to you or you've heard about it but don't know how to discover what your spiritual gifts are, 301 is the place for you. This one day class helps you learn more about them, their purpose, and helps you learn how to find yours. Scan the bulletin or sign up at the Welcome Center today. Ladies, Clay will be going through the Getting Out of Your Head Bible Study by Jenny Allen starting in just a couple weeks. You are invited to be a part. Scan the QR code on the bulletin or visit them at their booth today at the Ministry Fair. Koinonia Night is on Sunday, March 26th. Visit us for a night of prayer, worship with special guests and dinner. We can't wait to come together for this. We also encourage you to invite someone to come with you. For our men, we have men's breakfast coming up on April 1st. Check your bulletin for more information on that. Here at First Baptist Church, we believe in taking your next steps. If you're a guest with us today, we want you to fill out the welcome card. You can either scan the QR code that says connect on the back of your chair, or you can fill out the welcome card that you will find at the Welcome Center in the foyer. If you've been attending here for a while, we would love to see you serve with us. You can either scan the QR code on the back of your seat that says serve, or you can find a service card out at the Welcome Center in the foyer. The Give QR code is also available on the seat back in front of you to do your tithes and offerings at any time. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy worshiping with us. Well, amen. Good morning, everybody. If you have a Bible, turn to the book of Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And I'm going to encourage you to... Uh, for the thing at the ministry fair outside, you can thank uh, Liz and the crew for putting all that together for you. Yeah. Is that all y'all got? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Encouragement. Encouragement. So uh, don't forget next Sunday night and uh, Koinonia night, we'll dinner at five and worship at six ish. Ish. <laughs> Takes a while to feed you people. Amen. And uh, be in prayer about that, too. We want to pray for our, I want you to continue to pray for uh, our brother in the Lord, uh, Brother Keith, works the soundboard back there for us. Uh, Keith had to fly home to New Orleans Friday. His older brother was shot and killed in New Orleans. And so he is home uh, taking care of those things. And so we want to pray for him and Kathy and the family uh, during this season uh, as well. So uh, just keep a prayer for him. And uh, so that won't be around here for a couple of weeks, so we want to remember that as well. Also, I didn't get an update, but I have a friend of mine. Uh, he pastors in Ohio, and uh, his daughter was down in Ecuador on a choir trip for spring break. And if you didn't keep up with the news, Ecuador had a major earthquake yesterday, and they have not heard anything, and at least last I'd heard. So we want to remember them uh, during this time as well. All right, so I look forward to that. Looking forward to uh, next Saturday as well. I'll talk more about that as we go through our time today. Matthew chapter 20. I'm actually going to start in verse 20 and read through 28. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with her sons. She knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want, he asked her. And I say it that way. I'm not sure if Jesus said it that way, but <laughs> then if you keep listening to it, it kind of sounds like he probably would have said it that way promise she said to him that these two sons of mine may sit one at your right hand the other at your left in your kingdom 
Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? We are able, they said to him. He told them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and left is not mine to give. Instead, it's for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. When the ten disciples heard this, they became indignant with the two younger brothers. The reason they became indignant is because of the question they'd asked, and that mom went up and asked for him. Like, who are they to be coming up here and saying, who gets to sit next to, next to Jesus? And they were a little bit frustrated with that question. Jesus called them over and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those in high positions act as tyrants over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Father, we thank you for this time of worship and time in your word. Lord, as I pray every week, I pray I would decrease and you increase. Speak to our hearts and to our minds, not just for information, but for transformation. Make us more like Jesus, and he was a servant. For your glory and your kingdom, and it's in his name we pray, amen. So in looking at the preaching calendar that I had laid out earlier this year, we uh, felt led to do a missions fair tied to this. We've been doing this series called Why, Why Certain Things, Why Certain That's, but this one today was one that we tied to, Why Serve? Why Serve? Now immediately, this topic and the one next week, Why Give, is going to shut out half of y'all already. <laughs> already making your plans, getting out that phone right now, yeah, giving next week, yeah, I think we're, yeah, okay. I, I just know this how this works. I understand that. But serving is part of being a follower of Jesus. So let me just start off real quickly by talking about the reasons that I get most often about why we don't serve. And here's the biggest one, the first one right up there. I do not have time. I'll talk more about that one later. But that's one that I get most often. If we ask you this stuff, I don't have time to serve. Another one is, I do not know what I would do. You just don't know. It's church. I don't know what I would do. Next one is, I do not have any skills that could help. I can't, I can't do anything to help the church. All of these are lies, by the way. The next one, I love this one. They don't need me. They don't need me. To which I just want to say, with all due respect, really? Have you asked me? Have you asked other people who serve here? The answer to that is, we do. We'll talk more about that. Here's one that comes around often, too. I used to, but I got burned out. I got burned out. What does burned out mean? It means I just got tired of it. Got tired of doing ministry for whatever reason it may be, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Burnout is something that's been a, a huge factor in this COVID, post-COVID reality that we live in. Talk to pastors all the time who are wrestling with burnout, just tired of it. It's just been a grind for the last three and a half years. Some of them in the really churches smaller than ours, and they're just struggling to figure out. They've been trying to do what we've been doing here, just trying to figure out how to keep the doors open. How to do this, how to do that. Do we wear masks, don't wear masks? Do we meet, don't meet? And then getting yelled at by your parishioners because you listen to one guy over the other guy. Oh, don't worry, it happened here too. And if you listen to one group, you were called woke. 
Listen to the other group, you were called something else, and I'd rather not go over there. I just got burned out. I was talking to a guy this last couple of weeks ago. He pastors up 395, up towards Ridgecrest. And uh, he was asking about something that we, I need to announce to you right now. Let's go ahead and announce to you. Our, our new name will be Living Hope Church. Okay, and we're going to start using Living Hope Church. In, y'all can clap for that. <laughs> for those of you that are guests, we like clapping in church. It's actually a really cool thing to do. Um, if I wanted to go to a morgue, I'd go over the Desert View or a church. And so, so we'll start using that more around, around Easter. We'll kick that off kind of officially as we work towards that transition in all of that. So thank you for voting and being a part of that process. But he, he had heard that we were changing our name, and that actually is getting a lot of attention, believe it or not. I don't know why, but it just does. And so he was asking me about it, and I just talked to him, and I've known this guy for a while, and I said, so how, how are things going where you're at? Said, He's struggling. He's like, Rich, COVID killed us. And I'm running like 25 people, and we have this horrible reputation in our community, because I keep asking guests who come, and I, say, I said, well, what are you finding out? Well, they think that we're a bunch of white Christian nationalists who go to this church. So I think we need to change our name. So I want to know how you did that. Or how you are doing that, I guess is a better way to say that. I'm like, okay. I said, if you do this, you, he's, he's in his early 60s. You don't want to be struggling in your early 60s as to dealing with things like this. You could just hear it in his voice. And people do that in ministry. The grind of doing it week in and week out and, and just feeling like underappreciated or not appreciated at all and off seem, wanting help but never seeming to, seemingly able to get help causes people to just say, I can't do it anymore. You get burned out. But here's the one here. I mean, all of those other ones there, they have their little things. And these are, those top ones are the ones that I get when I come to you and ask you about this stuff. Because you're not going to tell me the real reason, which is that bottom one right there for most people. I just don't want to. I'm just being honest. You just don't want to. But being a follower of Jesus requires us to serve God and serve others. That is a non-negotiable. Amen? It is non-negotiable. Jesus said it. We say we love Jesus. We say we want to be like Jesus. Jesus just said here that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. So, Pastor, I want to be like Jesus, but don't ask me to serve. Because I ain't got time. It don't fit into my schedule. I'm going to be very frank about this, guys. This has been an issue in church life for decades. It used to be 20% of the people did 80% of the work. Now it's 15% of the people do 85% of the work. The trend is not going in the right direction. Everybody wants the church to do all these things, but then you say, hey, great, help me out with that. Can you help me out with that? Oh, no, don't ask me to help. I just want it. That's called Walmart. That is not being a follower of Jesus. And there's so many things that you can do. So I need to answer this question. For all of you here, young and old alike, don't worry, the, the, the first service got it just as much as you're going to get it, folks. The first thing is really simple. Why serve the church? Number one, develop spiritual gifts. 
Now, I'm just, this is not how I normally preach. I normally just work through the passage. I just wanted to use that as a kickoff point because I wanted to establish what Jesus said he was and is before we take off into everything else that I'm going to talk about here in the few minutes we have together here this morning. Jesus was a servant. He said that himself. He said that's why he came. He came and died on the cross for your sins to serve you. So that's the overarching thing. We want to be like Jesus. But he was a servant. So then we have to deal with the dilemma here, the the crisis of consciousness. I want to be like Jesus because he's cool. But he said he's a servant. How do we do that? See, God designed us this way. We're to develop spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 is one of the passages that talks about spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4. There's other places you can go to as well. But the first thing is we are to develop spiritual gifts. So now I have to walk through this with you to help you understand these things. For some of you, this isn't new. But for some of you, this may be revelatory, meaning you never heard this before in your life. Let's go. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters... I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you used to be enticed and led astray by idols. Mute idols, I should say. Therefore, I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed. This is why you really ought to think about it when you say, put, put, well, let me just be frank here. I'm going all out today. As a follower of Jesus, you ought to really think about it when you sit out there in your world you live in and you put damn it on the end of God's name. Anyway, and no one can say, listen to this, Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So what does that imply? If you are a follower of Jesus, it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that you can say Jesus is Lord. And if you are saying Jesus is Lord of your life, then you are gifted with spiritual gifts. At least one. My experience is that people get more than one, but some people may only get one spiritual gift gift. And that's what he starts talking about here as we walk through this. Now, there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, and there are. There's all kinds of ministries. we got all those ones out there. There's all kinds of giftings out there. Not everybody is called to preach and teach. That's okay. But you are called and gifted to do something. The Holy Spirit gives that to you. How do I know it's a spiritual gift? A spiritual gift is any gift that you have that you now have before, that you didn't have before you were a follower of Jesus. Now, in my case, for me, that's simple. I was not a public speaker before I got saved. That's just one example. There are different ministries. There's all kinds of ministries. But the same Lord. And there are different activities. There's all kinds of activities, but the same God works all of them in each person. A manifestation of the Spirit, that's a gift, is given to each person for the common good. Now, listen to me. This common good, it's for the common good of God's church. Your primary ministry and use of your spiritual gift in the body of Christ is in the body of Christ. If you come to me and say, I'm active out in Kiwanis or PTA or whatever else, but you're not doing any ministry in the church, you got it wrong. You got it wrong. The church is the only God-ordained institution 
on the face of this planet with the task of reaching the world with the gospel and making disciples. The PTA doesn't have that responsibility. The Rotary doesn't have that responsibility. And the only reason that we have parachurch groups is because the local church wasn't doing something that caused somebody to start that parachurch group. Example, Bill Bright in Campus Crusade, he started that because where he was at, local churches were not reaching college students very well, so he created Campus Crusade for Christ. Your primary ministry, the reason God gave you that spiritual gift that he saved you to do, those works which you were prepared in advance to do, is for the local church first. The fact that I have to say that with such force just tells you where we're at today. This is why you need to be a part of a local church. We'll get to that one too. To one is given the message of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the message of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by by one Spirit. To another, performing of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. One and the same Spirit is active in all these, distributing to each person as he wills. God gives you a gift, if you're a follower of Jesus, at least one. It is to be used primarily in the context of your local body of believers that you are a part of, your local church. The other thing you need to understand is that you don't get to decide what gifts you have. God does. Well, I don't like that gift. Talk to God. I can't help you. Now, again, it's been my experience that people tend to have more than one spiritual gift. They just haven't gone through the process of discovering what that is because they don't want to serve. I'm I'm just just being honest. We want to help you with that. We've been trying to help you with that. We want to do that. With you. So, so we are to develop the spiritual gifts that God gives us. That's what he saved us to do. That's what Ephesians 2.10 is all about. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do those things which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Those things he's prepared in advance for you to do, he prepares you to do, and he prepares you to do it by giving you a spiritual gift to do it. And this is the third person of the Trinity who does this. The Holy Spirit of God himself. We make this so complicated and so difficult that God just says receive it and apply it. We want to see God move in our life, amen? How many of us want to see God move in our life? We all do. When we use our gifts, we see God move. Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple for the time of prayer At three in the afternoon, a man who was lame from birth was being carried there. He was placed each day at the temple gate called Beautiful, so that he could beg from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for money. Peter, along with John, looked straight at him and said, look at us. So they turned, he turned to them expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have I give you in the name of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. Then taking him by the right hand, he raised him up, and at once his feet and his ankles became strong. So he jumped up and started to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized that he was the one who used to sit and beg at the beautiful gate in the temple. 
So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what happened to him. This is Peter. Remember Peter? Denied Jesus three times, Peter. Restored Peter. Then Pentecost, Peter. But, you know, you could kind of dismiss that one, right? You know, because they had gone into hiding after Jesus kind of went away. They were kind of, you know, know, maybe he went off and he he memorized that speech somewhere or something like that. But now he's just right there. And he just goes up to this guy and he says, get up and walk. And the guy just gets up and walks. Can you imagine Peter and John? The astonishment still to see God move. Because if you remember before at the Mount of Transfiguration, when Peter was up there and they had the Mount of Transfiguration, and they come down off the mountain, and Jesus gets frustrated because the disciples were trying to heal somebody and they couldn't do it. And Jesus gets frustrated. He says, how am I going to deal with these people? Now we come full circle. They just walk up to a guy. They've seen, I'm sure, a zillion times asking for money. And they say, get up and walk. And the guy gets up and walks. See, when you use your gifts and allow the Holy Spirit to move in you and work in you, you see God work in your life. And there is nothing more satisfying, more fulfilling in life than to see God move in your life. But you can't do that. If you just don't want to. Serving allows us to experience joy, peace, and be good stewards when we obey. A steward means manager. 1 Peter 4.10, just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve God others. God blesses you with a gift to serve others in his church. As good stewards of the varied grace of God, implying that there's different kinds of gifts. God gives us all kinds of gifts and skills to meet the needs of of it within our church and then from our church out into our community and everything else. And it brings us joy when we see God do that. It brings us fulfillment when we see God do that. There is nothing more joyful than seeing than using the gifts you know you have for God's glory and to God's kingdom. Nothing. There's nothing that gives you more peace at night than be able to lay down and put your head down saying, I used what God gave me today for his glory and his kingdom. You can put your head down on the pillow at night and sleep real sound. And God blesses us when we obey and listen to his word. Now, I get sometimes this is kind of be a struggle with some certain things. And, you know, we try here at the church, and we teach this in, in 301. We, there are times in the church life when you have to do what we need you to do and not necessarily what you're gifted to do. That actually, quite frankly, happens a lot. And, folks, let me just be right up frank, straight with you real quick. I've been doing this a long time. I have cleaned more toilets and mopped more floors than I've preached sermons in my day. So there is this sense of using our giftness, but there's also this sense of being willing to do whatever needs to be done. Why? Because our mission is too important. Do you know that 60% of this world, which is now at 8 billion people, has no knowledge of Jesus? You put that number on there. In California, 34 million have no knowledge or don't know who Jesus is. Or no relationship with him. I keep throwing these numbers out to you because these numbers have to start making an impact on our lives at some point, folks. 
157,960 people will die in this planet today without Jesus and spend eternity separated from God. God gifts us or brings us together for the very purpose of accomplishing that mission. We all have different things. We all have different skills and talents. I use this example often because it's just so true. I mean, I got Jason and Amanda over here. I don't know nothing about skating on those skateboards. They just said, hey, we really feel led to do this, start this kind of ministry. Great. Okay, my job is to equip. That's what Ephesians 4 says. I'm supposed to equip them to do skateboard ministry. <laughs> How do I do that? I use my skills and gifts to help them to do what they do. What was my skill and gift? Money. And knowing where to get it. And having the relationships to be able to put it together and make it happen. And then encouraging them with structure and organization and how to do things that are frustrating and still have to do them in a frustrating way because that's just how you've got to do things. And they are blessed when they go out on those Saturdays. Have you already started that little weekly thing? or try, Yeah. They go out, they do their thing. We don't even make too much about it. They just go out, they do their thing. And they sleep well at night on Saturday when they get home. Why? Because they found joy, peace. Because they obeyed the Lord and his call in their life to reach those world. That's true for every single person in this room. Serving gives us opportunity to be more like Jesus. I love John 13, 1 through 11. This is a familiar story. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had departed, or hour to depart from this world had come. He was going to the Father. He says this, or it says this, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. We talked a lot the last few weeks about loving as Jesus loved. That's how we're supposed to know. This is, the, this is it right here. It says, Now when it's time for supper, the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel, and tied it, tied him, tied it around himself. Next he poured water into the basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you don't realize now, but afterward you will understand. You will never wash my feet, Peter said. Here we go, one of these confrontations Jesus has with Peter. Remember before he had Peter, Jesus tell him he was going to die, and Peter says, you ain't going to die, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. It's kind of another one of those kind of conversations where, where Peter, in his haste, says something he shouldn't have said. And then he overreacts in the other direction. Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. I mean, if you're going to do it, let's do it all. One who is bathed, Jesus said to him, told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet. But he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, not all of you are clean. Jesus, at the end of his life, in that upper room, knowing that the time had come, knowing 
it was about to get really bad really quickly. Had one more lesson to teach the disciples. He could have just said, look, guys, I'm going to be out of here in a little bit. Law, wash, worship me. Look at me. Enjoy my time. Enjoy me one last time. He didn't do that. He took the towel and wrapped it around his waist and he washed the disciples' feet. Only what a slave would do. And I read this story sometimes and I think about our world today and I think, I think sometimes, and maybe in this room some people are that way and I think some people think they're this way. They, they think they're doing Jesus the favor by being in this room right now. Jesus, you have the privilege of me being in your church. Or maybe doing me a favor. And we have this attitude of, Jesus, serve me. Jesus, do something for me, then I'll do something for you. It's a bad theology. Jesus, you fix my wrecked life, and then I'll take care, then, then I'll serve you. Wrong. start using your gifts and serving other people and watch God heal your life. We are so narcissistic in our world today that we actually think we're doing God the favor. When as I put out this morning on, on Facebook, not this morning, I know I put out someplace this week, God don't need us. What part of God doesn't need you, don't you understand? But because he loves you, he empowers you, he saves you, and gives us the glorious privilege of loving him and loving a neighbor and gifting us with his Holy Spirit, with the third person of the Trinity, to be able to do so. That's humbling. You know, when I was ordained at my home church back in Virginia, I washed the feet of those who raised me up. Raised me, raised me up, whatever some you want to use. Because I felt like that was important. To acknowledge what they had taught me. And they had taught me a lot of stuff. They taught me not to be lazy when it comes to my Christianity. And they taught me that it oftentimes takes a towel and a water basin to do most of the things you do to glorify God and advance his kingdom. I got this several years later through the Center for Faith Walk Leadership. This is an organization that's run by, uh, or it was run by Ken Blanchard and Phil Hodges. They're the authors of the One Minute Manager and those kinds of things. And they gave us this, and I keep this in my office on my book, one of my bookcases. And just a reminder: we're gifted to do to use this. We're not gifted for shares and likes, and hashtags. We're gifted to serve God and serve other people. We find fulfillment when we do that, when we use our gifts. Everybody who's a follower of Jesus, if they're going to be like Jesus, must be willing to serve.
Now, we take that very seriously here. Or at least we try to. I told the first service, I said, you guys in the first service, I know where you guys are at because you guys are at that point in life where you feel somehow feel like you are uh, somehow a little bit entitled because you've done your time. Wrong. It's wrong. I said, if you look around during COVID, Pastor Carlos and myself and Rita, we all, as we're trying to scramble through here and do this, we were trying to get those that are younger than you involved. If you look around who run, operates this place on a pretty regularly basis around here, they're all a lot younger than me. And as I told the first sister, that makes them really a lot younger than you. In an ironic twist, Pastor Tim, you know what I've noticed as I've thought? I think sometimes the younger people wonder where the seniors are in the 830 service. When we're supposed to be serving one another. Everybody playing their part. And doing their part. Pastor Tim tries to pound this into our students. They have a little serve table, all these things we talk about here. They have them upstairs. Getting them involved. Plugging them in. Do something. See, because the reality is the older we get, the more our rut of life gets deep and harder to get out of. And there is a certain amount of sense in which I told, as I told them in the first service, yeah, I know your rut's kind of hard to jump out of, so we're, we're really working on, we're working on them. Actually, we're not working, we're letting the Spirit do what He does. We just got to put people in a place to succeed. Serving promotes community, koinonia. Koinonia means sharing together. We call it living life together. We call them koinonia nights because we live life together. We're a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to live life together. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Many of you know this passage already. We'll probably look at it again here in a couple of weeks. And let us consider one another, not ourselves, one another. In order to what? Provoke love and good works not neglecting the gathering together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another or each other and all the more as you see the day approaching see as followers of Jesus we believe Jesus is coming back thank you one person we believe he's coming back and until such time we need each other why? Because the world don't want us. I don't know if y'all are paying attention. They don't want us. And as we gather, this is why you can't neglect gathering. This is why once a month Christianity, becoming normal Christianity, means bad news for Christianity. We've got to provoke one another. I like provoke. Compel, sometimes people use compel, but provoke is a very strong word. We, that word kind of ignotes us. We don't like to be provoked. Don't provoke me. It's like a threat. You know, don't provoke me. I mean, heaven forbid we provoke one another to do good to one another and to love one another and to serve one another. I mean, how, how bad is that? How bad are we to provoke such things? It builds community when we minister together and serve one another and love one another and live life together through the thick and thick and toils and stairs. I've been at this church since 2006. April 1st is 10 years as senior pastor of this crazy place. And you know what? I've raised my kids here. There's several of us in here. The, the kids are in here. They spent night at my house, their house. We have lived life together. We've buried family members together. We've done all this stuff together. We have lived life together. Now I'm going to get myself in trouble with all the English speakers in this room because, quite frankly, this is one of those things that I said earlier in the year that we, in the English side of the house, need to start learning from our Spanish side of the house. They do koinonia a whole heck of a lot better than we white folk do. Because some of y'all, with this ministry fair and everything going on out there, are going to make sure you make your way to that door on your right side 
and make your way out the door. You're not going to even try and fetch your way down that way because you're not going to go sit there and say, I'm not going to sit there and have them try and get me to rope me into something. As if we're trying to coerce you into doing anything. It promotes community when we minister and serve together. It promotes love for one another when we serve together and use our gifts together. It increases our faith. My favorite passage of Scripture, you guys know this, Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, folks, I read that, and I say, if I can think it, I'm thinking too small. What do you believe about what God can do in your life? I just told you, you're, if you're saved, you say Jesus is Lord. If you say Jesus is Lord, the Holy Spirit is in you. If you say the Holy Spirit is within you, you, you have a spiritual gift, at least one, probably more than one. They are to be used within the church for the common good of the church, the building up of his kingdom. You do that and you find joy and peace when you obey God. It promotes community, it promotes faith, it promotes love. Do you believe that? Does God just not fit in your schedule? We have to ask these tough questions, guys. Do we leave the burden to the faithful 15%? It's not how God wants it. Moses had to learn this. Remember Moses? Moses was trying to govern the Inland Empire by himself. That's how many people it was. Finally, his father-in-law came to him and says, what are you doing, dude? You're going to fry. And so he figured it out. Then you remember the battle down there, and he was keeping his hands raised, and when he raised his hands, they were winning, and when his hands got tired and the hands fell, Israel would lose. So what happened? They brought two guys up next to him, and they just rested and put him on these rocks, and they held his arms up. It's a church. Very quickly, serving allows us to see God work in new ways. I'm going to go through these. You guys have the scriptures. You can go look them up. Serving is good for our souls. Galatians 6 2 says, Carry one another's burdens in this way and it will fill the law, fulfill the law of Christ. We are to serve each other. We carry each other's burdens when we do that. Let us not, Galatians 6 9. Let you ready? You ready? It's in the Bible. I'm going to gonna, gonna let you say it this morning. Let us not get tired. Not get tired of doing good. For we will reap at the proper time if we do not give up. Or for some of you, if we start. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 16, don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. Folks, here's the bottom line. We make time for what we value. That is true for every single person in this room. You make time for what you value. You will exhaust yourself. You will kill yourself if you value it. Oh, parents who get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to be the first one in the parking lot at Disneyland. Don't tell me. You will not make time for what you value. There is something we can do because that is the way God works. We all have gifts. We all have skills to contribute to, the, to God, to his church and to his, to his kingdom. Folks, the church needs 
you. Don't walk out these that door. Go out those doors. Go that way. So you need to go walk through the ministry fair. You need to take 301. You can sign up for that at the Welcome Center. Teach that next week. That's an acronym. I'll discover, tell you what the acronym is, but it's about discovering your spiritual gifts. And then the other thing, the final thing, the best thing you can do, do something. Do something. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. Lord, may you speak to our hearts and our minds. May your spirit convict us. Lord, may all of us find that which you've called us and saved us to do and use it for your glory and your kingdom in your church and to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great day, everybody. Go that way to the ministry fair. We'll see you guys next week.